Second International Congress on Consciousness. I'm here with talking with another of the speakers that had been with us, and actually it's for me a great pleasure. It's Dr. Ping Van Lommel. He is from the Netherlands, and he's one of the experts on the near-death experience phenomenon. And um, he has just presented a very, very interesting talk, and let's hear a little bit about it. But first of all, Dr. Van Lommel, I would like to ask, how did you first got interested in this? Because of course you were a cardiologist, regular doctor like everyone else, and we know very few pay, pay attention to this field because it points to a very complex or complicated topic, right? So maybe you tell us a little bit about this, the behind stage of how all of that started. Well, the first time I ever heard a patient tell about what happened in his consciousness during cardiac arrest was in 1969. Mm -hmm. So it was the time that the first resuscitations were possible. Mm -hmm. Before 1967, all patients died because of cardiac arrest. So the first, one of the first cardiac care units in the Netherlands, I was just working as a starting cardiologist. And we resuscitated a patient, and within four minutes he regained consciousness. And we were, as a resuscitation team, were very happy because it was all new for us. But he was extremely disappointed to come mm -hmm. back. And he told about the tunnel, about music, about the landscape, etc. I've never forgotten the death event, but it didn't do anything for me. I didn't know anything about the death experience. It, even the terminology didn't exist because it was only Raymond Moody in 1975 who wrote the book Life After Life. I didn't read the book at all. But only in 1986 I read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes his extensive near death experience as a medical student in yes, 1943. Yes, I read that one and I love it. Oh, yes. I love it. It's a very yes. impressive. Simple but very impressive, definitely. So I was impressed by this book. Yes. And that was the moment in 1986 that I started to ask my patients who survived the cardiac arrest if they had memories of the period of consciousness, from the period of cardiac arrest. And within two years, out of 50 patients, 12 of them told me about the near death experience. Wow. So that was the moment that I said, well, I always read it is impossible to have experiences when your heart stops, when your breathing stops, when you're deep unconscious. I've learned in university that consciousness is a product of brain function. So when there is no brain function, people should not have any memory of this period. So that's and so it started with scientific curiosity. How is it possible that people can report this kind of experiences? And according to our current knowledge, it's not possible. So that's the reason we started in 1988, mm -hmm. a prospective study in 10 Dutch hospitals, uh, in total of 344 consecutive patients who survived cardiac arrest, to look if you could understand the cause and content of an NDE. And uh, what we found out that uh, of these 344 patients, 82% did not have any memory at all. Mm -hmm. but 62 patients, 18% had a clear memory of the period of unconsciousness. And if you try to understand how it could happen, uh, then there was no difference at all between the 82% of patients who did not report an near-death experience and the 18% who did report in the duration of cardiac arrest. If it was two minutes or eight minutes, didn't matter at all the duration of unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. So it was five minutes of three weeks of coma. Didn't matter at all. I see. Complicated CPI, didn't matter at all. And also to give a medication, pharmacological explanation, or fear of death before the arrest, psychological explanation. No gender, no education, no fullness. Did you know that these experiences are possible? Didn't matter at all. So there was no scientific explanation why people report these near-death experiences. So, so we could exclude anoxia of the brain, which mm -hmm. means lack of oxygen in the yes. brain as a cause mm -hmm. of this kind of experience. Because, because until that time, everybody said, well, it's just anoxia of the brain, or it's side effect of drugs, or just hallucination, whatever. So that was the important uh, conclusion of our study, that there was no scientific explanation at all, according to our current knowledge. And the, the, they all told us the classical universal elements, uh, like uh, being out of the body, have out of body perceptions from the, their own resuscitation, uh, meeting deceased relatives, mm -hmm. uh, going through a tunnel, meeting the 
being of light, feeling unconditional love. So the characteristics seem to be super consistent, right? Super consistent. Throughout the history. There are universal elements that always have been told in the past as well. So and the near death experience is not new at all. So in, in, in all cultures, in all time, in all religion, these uh, experiences have been reported, but in different names, like mystical experience, or religious experience, experience of oneness, whatever people will call it. But because of the modern techniques of resuscitation, more patients now can tell this about the near-death experiences. We had another aspect of the study, which was a long-term, long-term study, with interviews two years eight years after the cardiac arrest, they were all patients still alive in an NDE. And a match control group of patients who did not report an NDE to see if the transformation people talk about is a result of the cardiac arrest or a result of the death experience. Oh. It was not, never been studied before in a prospective design. Uh -huh. And the transformation people tell us at first, there's no fear of death anymore. They know what is important in life, but it's about love, unconditional love, compassion, empathy first towards yourself, accept who you are, accept your negative aspects, and then towards others and toward nature, towards the earth, because we feel connected with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the third aspect, where they always reluctant to share it, is, is the enhanced attitude of sensitivity. So they feel connected with, with other people. They, they know about future effects, uh, events like prognostic dreams. They, feel contact with people at a distance. They know what people feel and think. And, uh, and we found out that only patients with the death experience had did experience this, this transformation. But the death experience is also a spiritual trauma because they cannot share it with others. 70% had is a, a divorce because the partner said it's not the same person as before. I see. And, and hardly any physician doctor can, can listen without mm -hmm. privileges. Yes. So it's, it's very hard. So the first five to ten years are mostly in depression, loneliness. And, and yes, and I imagine they feel they want to change their lives and the other ones are a little lost what's going on, uh, even if the changes are good. Say, well, yes, is that what you, you mean? You have to accept your experience and to accept it, you have to share, it has to be possible to share it with others, yes, otherwise you think I'm great. It has to become part of your life, yeah. yes. Uh, and, and then the second thing is to integrate it. Your, your yes. new insight into the So that will take five, ten years or more. We had one study in, in, uh, in the Netherlands done. The 84 patients who had a near death experience in the past with a mean average time of 24 years, and still, after an average of 24 years, still half of them were not able to share it with others. They wow. still kept silent. That because it wasn't possible to talk about it. Nobody half could, of them. Wow. Nobody could listen. So it, it's a trauma as well. Yes, I can imagine how hard that is. And now in the Congress here you presented to us, it seems what was a summary of four studies, no. hundreds of patients, is that right? Yeah, yeah. so our study is still the, the largest study ever, yeah. prospective study of the four patients, but there has one study been done in the United States mm -hmm. by Lewis Grace and two studies in, in the UK by Sampania and by uh, Satori and a total of 562 patients who survived cardiac arrest. So the st same study design as our study. Mm -hmm. And also all the other authors found no scientific explanation, no physiological explanation like anoxia yes. of the brain, yeah. no psychological explanation. So they all said it is impossible that people report conscious experiences during cardiac arrest, but it still happens. So we have to reconsider our concept and never prove an assumption yes. that consciousness is a product of brain function. Yes. Because the brain function has ceased in yes. cardiac arrest. Of course, so something has to be adjusted in the whole model so that we can study that. Exactly. So, so we have to accept, and it's, it's a challenge to, to talk about that, that the never proven assumption that consciousness is a product of brain function yes. is not true. Not true. So but, uh, our concept as a conclusion of our studies is that, so we had to, re to reconsider the never approved assumption that the conscious is a product of brain function because we know from cardiac arrest patients that the brain function has ceased totally. There's no blood going to the brain. There, there's no uh, body reflexes, no brain stem reflexes, no breathing, and the EEG flatlines in, within 15 seconds. So there's no activity at all. Yes. And they still, people can have this paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness yes. with the possible of perception, cognition, emotion, etc. 
and how, I do not know if you know that from the top of your mind, but percentage of perceptions people had that could be confirmed, like hearing something that was going on in the room or seeing something that was happening at the same time? Well, it, it, it's essential to have to corroborate these veridical yeah. perceptions. And in our study, we had a, a very impressive story. Will I share it with you? Yes. Yeah. So it, it was a, pa yes. a patient of 44 years old who was mm -hmm. brought into a hospital to Berlin Carrier. Uh, he was found in a meadow about 30 minutes before. And when he came in in hospital, he was blue, cyanotic, cold, wow. no breathing, deep coma no body reflexes, no brain yes. cell reflexes, so his widened pupil didn't react on life. Mm -hmm. So what the nurse did is, the first thing, to uh, intubate the patient, to give him more oxygen. But he found out that the patient had dentures in his mouth, so he took out the dentures and put it somewhere on the crash cart. And it took about one and a half hour before the patient had blood pressure and circulation again. But he was still in deep coma without breathing, so he needed artificial respiration. So he was transferred to the intensive care unit where he was in coma for another week. When he regained consciousness, he was brought back to the cardiac ward. And the moment he was there, the nurse came in for medication and he sort of said, you know where my dentures are. And he could explain that the nurse had put it somewhere in a drawer underneath exactly where he had put it in the, in the crash cart. And he could describe the small room where he was, had been resuscitated, where he came in in coma and was taken out in coma, could describe the people who were resuscitated. So it was corroborated. And there are more cases. Uh, there's been a publication by Jen Holden and also a recent book. So mm -hmm. more than 100 cases have been corroborated. Yes, yes, of course, a percentage of them, but that is very important because I think that adds a lot. This is how you somehow uh, combine the ideas and you bring the idea of the non-locality of consciousness yeah. from the perspective or, or the framework of the near-death experience. Do you think you can give us a brief on that? Yeah, yeah. I know it's <laughs> complex, but no, maybe... It, 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 it's not that complex at all. Okay. People, when they have the near-death experience, they can yes. have memories from the past. Okay. And they are back in the what past. What do you mean by past? The past this in this from, life? Yes, mostly from this life. Okay. Or from the moment of birth. Mm -hmm. They feel connected with the consciousness of other people in the uh -huh. past. So when you took some plaything from your little sister, you know how sad she was. You, you feel connected with the consciousness of uh -huh. others in the past. Uh -huh. You can see or perceive future events as well. So in this dimension where they are with this consciousness, there's the future and the past is available and present at the same moment. So at the moment you concentrate upon the thing, you are there. So it's beyond time and beyond space, and everything is connected. And that's exactly the definition of non-locality. Yes. Yes. Everything is connected beyond time and beyond yes. space. And when they are back in the body, they have the enhanced intuitive sensitivity, which means that they have non-local information. They receive information, not by the senses, mm -hmm. not by the body, receive information from a distance I see. and at the same moment yes. from, so from the future as well. So they, they have still the capacity to receive these non-local aspects of consciousness which is not produced by the brain but the brain functions as a receiver or receive, as, a, as yes. an interface. Just a translating somehow. Uh, yes, an interface. And I, I, I compare it, mm. I, I like to compare it with the iCloud. Uh -huh. the, the information of one billion websites is always everywhere, but you need an instrument. That's an interesting analogy. To, to, yes. to receive it. And the, we know that the internet mm -hmm. is not produced by the computer, but it's received by it. So you need a brain to receive it into your waking consciousness. But it's always there. And when you have had the internet, you're uh, uh, able to receive more information. So the threshold has changed as well. Yes, yes, and of course that enlightens a lot about the nature of consciousness and how the brain operates in all that, and we see that the brain, it seems not to be the core. Consciousness must be somehow beyond the brain to yeah, have it, all it, that. It facilitates, facilitates, but doesn't produce I, I the totally understand. To experience. As you said, it's the interface. It's the interface. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you so much. Anything you would like to add, Dr. Van Lannan? No, I, I think it's important to, to, to spread this word, f especially for healthcare, for patient yes. terminal care, uh, patient in coma, how yes. do we discuss it, organ transplantation, yes. what is brain death, yes. exactly, what is about consciousness of yes. brain death patients. So it has a lot of ethical implications, but also 
for science, the mind-brain relationship yes. is important. Mm -hmm. And also for our ideas about life and death. Life and because death. death is just the end of our physical aspects, but there's a continuity of consciousness. Yes, and of course, once we accept or understand or acknowledge even that possibility that changed completely how we see life. Just sharing with you something that you just mentioned and made me remind. Um, I received so many contacts of people that I don't know, but normally nurses, mm. more than medical doctors at all. Or but nurses, much better. <laughs> somehow more open maybe, less yeah, constrained, yeah. and they tell me, I see things with patients that are, you know, in terminal stages of their lives, and the reports are amazing. We should find a way to put all of that together and study, not in order to say that is representative of all cases, but that is a possibility of some cases and needs to be acknowledged, because these nurses, they do not know what to do. They want to help, and they feel themselves confused. So it's confusing for those who work in the so health that's system. that's what we call the end-of-life experience, so yes. death with patients, and it's a, it, it's hardly anybody reports it, that there has been a study done in Switzerland uh, where about 90% of the terminal ill patients have these kind of experiences, but they hardly share it with others, yes. let alone with family members or with nurses. So uh, also near-death experiences occur about in, 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 in the United States for about 10 million people. After death communication, then you have the inner feelings being contact with the consciousness of deceased relative. About 100 million in the United States, about 125 million people in Europe have had this kind of experience. But they're silent about it because they don't dare to share it with others. They think it was just a dream. Yes. But it is a conscious experience yes. with the contact of the consciousness of deceased relative. Yes, I think there is a lot of prejudice behind some of these concepts. It's prejudice and it is willful ignorance because they are frightened. Most yes. people are frightened. frightened. That it could be different as we yes. always have learned. Yes, <laughs> and what would be the consequences of that? Well, quite a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, so much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for all of you to be with us.